Timothy uh, called Prepare the Way. And this morning we're going to be talking about being forerunners. Uh, actually, the title I have is Spiritual Fitness. You know, I like to run. And uh, looking through the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see many examples of, of running. There was the time that Elijah outran the horses coming down from Mount Carmel. And then, you know, Paul talks about um, he has finished his race. And in Hebrews it talks about let us run our race and so forth. So this analogy of our spiritual life being compared to running a race is, you know, that, that's part of, of the Christian uh, lexicon, has been, you know. But there's something about being a forerunner that means more than just uh, the, the act of running. And so I don't want you to hear what I'm saying today strictly in physical terms because we're going to talk about the, the spiritual significance of certain aspects of running. <clears throat> First of all, let's go to Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> Being a forerunner, actually we have two, two possible meanings of that. One is that you're, you're running out in front. That's one strategy in, in uh, winning a race is if you can get out way in front of your competitors, then, then that sometimes has a demoralizing effect. But also, being a forerunner means that you have advanced knowledge about some things that, that are coming. Like Noah, being warned of things yet not seen, built the ark for the saving of his household. Right? So... We're going to want to be uh, ahead of the curve of what's going on in this world. And, and it says that, uh, that the crooked places will be made straight and the rough places smooth. And, the, and then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it. Well, that means there's some work to do first to, to remove the obstacles, right? So that's what, that's what this is about. This is... When we talk about spiritual fitness, we're talking about getting ready for this time that's leading up to the, the coming of the Lord. And I know a lot of Christians seem to say, well, all I can do is just ask Jesus to come into my heart and God does the rest. Well, okay, God does the rest. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you by your own efforts can, can be ready for what's coming. You know, this is the problem that a lot of people that we might call preppers, uh, have is, well, how do you know what, uh, what crisis to prepare for? There are so many. And, and, and if you're just trying to do it in the natural, uh, you're going to leave something out. So we're, we're not talking about natural preparedness in that sense, although I'm sure, you know, if God does have something you need to do, he said he will do nothing but what? He will reveal it to his servants, the prophets. And we're prophets. It says that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Anyway, Luke chapter 1, verse 13. Here's the, uh, the New Testament model of a forerunner. John the Baptist. Verse 13. By the way, everything I'm going to read today is going to be amplified version. The angel said to Zechariah, do not be afraid, Zechariah, because your petition was heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you must call his name John, which means God is favorable. You know, we want to be in God's favor, don't we? Okay, and you shall have joy and exultant delight, and many will rejoice over his birth, for he will be great and distinguished in the sight of the Lord. He must drink no wine nor strong drink, and he will be filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit even in and from his mother's womb. Well, that verse right there has a lot of implications from the book of Revelation. Uh, first of all, you know, in Revelation 12, it talks about the woman being pregnant. 
and giving birth to the man-child. And we understand what that is. That's not Mary giving birth to Jesus uh, or Israel giving birth to something or other. It's the church giving birth to manifested sons. But then it also talks about not drinking wine or strong drink. Well, uh, that's, that's good health advice just in the natural. You know, those, those things are not good for you. I mean, I know that, that they do, uh, that a lot of medications, and so back in the day, almost every medication had alcohol in it. But I'm, we're not really just talking about uh, physical alcohol here. We're talking about the, the wine that it speaks of that, that the, uh, the harlot has. Well, you want to read that? Keep the place here. Go to Revelation chapter 17. So for us to see the analogy of John the Baptist representing us now in this day and time, you know, it was said, well, he's not to drink wine or strong drink. Well, what is that? Are you saying, well, I can't have Boone's Farm? <laughs> Don't drink Boone's Farm, please. <laughs> oh, man. But um, Revelation chapter 17, verse 1 says, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, this is judgment now he's talking about, came and spoke to me saying, come and I will show you the doom of the great harlot who is seated on many waters, she with whom the rulers of the earth have joined in prostitution, which is symbolic of idolatry, and with the wine of whose immorality the inhabitants of the earth have become intoxicated. The inhabitants of earth are getting intoxicated right now by all kinds of things. And that intoxication is not just, uh, just partying. It's not just uh, you know uh, entertainment, although they're getting intoxicated with that. But there's a lot of toxic things in our world. <clears throat> there's a lot of things that, that pollute us in our, in our spirit. And there's a lot of things that pollute us in our body. Um, you know, I, it has been said that the 5G radiation that they're now using to make all the internet and cell phone stuff do, that that's putting more, um, more radiation, more heat into the atmosphere, and that that um, activates a lot of diseases and so forth. But we're, again, we're not just talking about physical things here. That those are types and shadows of spiritual things. So, back to Luke chapter 1, verse 15, it says that the forerunner, the one who is favored by God, will not be drinking the wine of Babylon the harlot, but we will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from our mother's womb. See, and we're still, metaphorically speaking, we're still in the mother's womb right now. We have not come forth as the man-child yet. It says, And he will turn back and cause to return many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And he himself will go before the Lord in the, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn back the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And the disobedient and incredulous and unpersuadable to the wisdom of the upright, which is the knowledge of the holy love and will of God, in order to make ready for the Lord a people perfectly prepared in spirit, adjusted, disposed, and placed in the right state. This is a new thing, I would say. I mean, yes, it's something God has always been doing. I mean... You know, he promised that, to, Paul promised that to the jailer in Philippi, said, if you'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved and your household. But we've seen through the, the, uh, the wine of the harlot in our world, we've seen such a destruction of the family that, that bringing the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, it almost looks insurmountable at this point in time. But see, this is, this is part and parcel of what God intends to do in these days leading up to the second coming of the Lord, and he intends to use us to do it. 
this, your mission, should you accept it, would be to be this right here, to go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah. And I'm actually seeing uh, little evidences of this in my own family. Uh, I, I'm seeing more um, opportunities to, to share deeper spiritual truths like with my son, uh, that he's been more open to this, that through this global pandemic thing that has happened, it's like everybody's realizing, hey, we're in a new day here, that things aren't like they used to be. Well, that is an opportunity. That's an opportunity for us to, to share the things of God. Now, go to Colossians chapter 1. In that it's an opportunity, of course, we don't want to blow it, but sometimes it feels like, well, I'm just not equal to the task. Well, God has said he will make us equal to the task. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this reason we also, from the day that we have heard of it, have not ceased to pray and make request for you, asking that you may be filled with the full, deep, and clear knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom, in comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God, and in understanding and discernment of spiritual things. That really is the essence of what I'm talking about today when we talk about spiritual fitness. It's that right there. But it says that you may walk, live, and conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him and desiring to please Him in all things, bearing fruit in every good work and steadily growing and increasing in and by the knowledge of God. And we pray that you may be invigorated and strengthened with all power according to the might of his glory, to exercise. See, this is, that's the metaphor here. We're talking about an exercise. To exercise every kind of endurance and patience, perseverance and forbearance with joy. There are so many little metaphors in here of, of, of the, the exercise program of a runner that we're going to talk about today. But let me read verse 12 first. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints, of God's holy people in the light. Okay, but you see there's a fitness. And it's a spiritual fitness. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And God says he will do it. Now, he does want our participation. He wants our agreement. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, says, If you lay all these instructions before the brethren, you will be a worthy steward and a good minister of Christ Jesus, ever nourishing your own self on the truths of the faith and of the good instruction which you have closely followed. See, there is a, a spiritual principle. It's basically the principle of sowing and reaping. And that is, you know, uh, you reap what you sow. I mean, everybody knows that. But point being, if you are sowing in your own life the revelation of the Word of God, that is going to make you a more qualified and more fit person to share good things with others. You know, if you want to be useful to God as a minister, then you need to be feeding upon his revelation. You know, and, and a lot of people kind of think that, oh, well, that, that it's all kind of my zeal. You know, I, I have a passion for the Lord, so I'm going to go out and save everybody I can. And if they don't get uh, that, that accurate instruction that he talks about here, then it, it doesn't really get very much done. It, and it says in verse 7, but refuse and avoid 
irreverent legends, profane and impure, godless fictions. Can you say fake news? Godless fictions and, and silly myths. And some of the silly myths they're p- putting forth on the, the mainstream media telling you this is the way that it is when it isn't. Okay? And that, that comprehensive discernment is what we need in order to be able to tell what is and what isn't. Okay? And express your disapproval of them. You know, there are those in, in, the, in the body of Christ that think that that if you talk about conspiracy theories or if you, if you say anything at all against the government, that, oh, well, you're not being a good Christian because you're, you're supposed to just go right along with what the government tells you. Well, if, if what they're telling you is not the truth, you are on good, solid, scriptural ground to express your disapproval of it. Or did I read that wrong? Okay. Verse 8. No, excuse me. Uh, train yourself, this is the last part of verse 7, train yourself toward godliness, keeping yourself spiritually fit. For physical training is of some value, useful for a little, but godliness, spiritual training, is useful and of value in everything and in every way, for it holds promise for the present life and for the life which is to come. And you know, the life that is to come is not necessarily, well, some golden day break off in heaven, or even, well, three or four years or five or whatever it is in the millennial kingdom. The life that is to come might be this summer, right? So we need to train ourselves and be spiritually fit so we can be ready for any and everything that may be coming our way. And as we have seen, if you've learned anything in the last three months, you've learned that things can change suddenly and irrevocably and, and drastically and worldwide. Yeah, so, so being prepared is, is a good idea, I would say. Now, what I'm going to be talking about this morning has been things that I have picked up in... in uh, Running, you know, in in, in uh, exercise uh, blogs and and the the advice of of uh, coaches that coach running and and so forth. And I will say that it, it stood me in pretty good stead for for getting ready for the marathons and whatnot that I've run. And 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 it's it's never uh, I've never gotten injured from any of those things that I've been doing for the last twenty years. To, to God be the glory, okay? I'm, I'm not saying it's all me, nor am I saying, well, those coaches are so good. But because um, the Lord would kind of direct me and say, okay, now read what that guy says, and you need to do that. Like, don't increase how many miles you run per week by more than 10%. That's a really good idea. Yeah. If you say, okay, I ran, I ran 10 miles this week, I'm going to go run 30 next week. Uh-uh, that's not a good idea. You know, a lot of Christians do that. A lot of, a lot of Christians think, well, well, you know, I, I hadn't been uh, really uh, going to church or reading the Bible or everything. And then, then they, they hear some preacher on TV or something. And they get all excited. Okay, I'm going to go out and witness on the street corner. And uh, that sometimes doesn't turn out very well. So anyway, we're going to talk about some of the elements uh, of, of fitness training that a running coach would, would give to someone who, who is going to run any particular kind of race. And it works for different, different lengths of races, too. Uh, there are four elements. You know what? I think I'm going to write these down on the board because the, these have spiritual implications. Okay, the first thing that they tell you to do is what they say, build your aerobic base. That simply means get your heart and lungs in shape. You know, get to where going out and uh, walking, running, whatever you're going to do, that it doesn't, you know, you're not <laughs> out of breath after you've gone, you know, half a mile. A- and that just means just go out and do it. Okay? Let's talk about the spiritual aspect of aerobic base. You know, aerobic, the word aerobic has to do with air, right? Well, 
What would be the, the, the biblical Greek counterpart for that? It's the word pneuma, which is, means spirit. So building your aerobic base spiritually means walking in the spirit. That means not walking in the flesh. You know, choosing spirit uh, path instead of a flesh path. Uh, Romans 8. Go to the 8th chapter of Romans. Verse 13 in Romans 8 gives you the incentive to walk in the Spirit. It says, for if you live according to the dictates of the flesh, you will surely die. You know, if you just do what makes your flesh comfortable in the long run, it's not going to be good for you. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit you are habitually putting to death the evil deeds prompted by the body, you will really and genuinely live forever. Because in verse 1 it says, Therefore there is no condemnation, no adjudging guilty of wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live and walk after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus the law of our new being has freed me from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law could not do, its power being weakened by the flesh. God sending his own son in the guise of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He subdued and overcame and deprived its power over everyone who will accept Jesus' sacrifice so that the righteous and just requirements of the law might be fully met in us who live and move not in the ways of the flesh but in the ways of the Spirit. See, God has done what is necessary for us to live the kind of life he wants us to live by Jesus paying the price for us. So how do we get that? Well, we choose it. It's a choice. Just like uh, deciding you're going to exercise is a choice. Just like Steve in the year 20, 2000, year 2000. I remember after church one Sunday, I was saying, you know what, I am out of shape and and I, all I have to do is just walk up those stairs to the sound room and I'm panting and I'm out of breath. And I think at that time you had been having some physical therapy and they, they told you, well, running is a good thing. You said, well, I go over to River Legacy Park every now and then and run. And so I went with you and about after half a mile, I was saying, let's walk. I, you remember that? He, he said, can we walk a little way? Yeah, and, yeah. And I think I quoted Romans 8.1. I said, there you go condemnation. Right? I, think, I think you're right, yes. But see, the point is, it's a choice, and it's a choice in the physical, just like it's a choice in the spirit. We can choose to walk in the spirit, and if we do, God enables us to walk in the spirit. But you've got to choose it, he, and he isn't going to grab you and make you do it. Um, go to, go, keep the place here in Romans, but go to Galatians chapter... Um, five. You knew where I was going, didn't you? Uh -huh. Galatians 5, verse 16. It says, But I say, walk and live habitually in the Spirit, responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit, and then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and desires of the flesh, of human nature without God. For the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh. So and They're antagonistic to each other, so that you are not free, but are prevented from doing what you desire to do. So there you see, again, it's a choice we make. 
<clears throat> and it's like in 1 Corinthians 10 where it says God will, will make the way of escape. If you're in that situation where you're being tempted to indulge your flesh and you know, hey, this is not wrong, you know, you're tempted to, to have a bowl of bluebell ice cream and there's an apple there. It's like the Holy Spirit says, which one of those do you think you ought to have? Uh, yes, sir, I hear you. <laughs> Not that there's any condemnation if you take the ice cream, but, you know, if you were on some kind of a, of a diet regimen, uh, you know which one would be better, right? Okay, now that's what we're talking about, of aerobic base. It's simply you just walking in the Spirit and... The word habitually was in there. In verse 16, it says, if you do this habitually, you know, if, if you're going to build an aerobic base, uh, you're, you decide you're going to run a race at some point and you want to get physically fit and ready for it. You don't just, okay, I went out and went, went around the block twice and, and then, you know, five days go by before you do it again. No, you have to do this regularly. That's why in Hebrews 10, 25, it says, don't forsake the assembling together, right? You know, there needs to be some kind of regularity with it. And everybody's schedule is different. You know, some people can actually go out and run five days a week. Some people can only do it two or three, four, whatever it is. But, you know, whatever your schedule will allow, stick with it. Be, pardon the word, but be religious about it. Be be dedicated to it. That's part of what makes the aerobic thing a base. The base means, okay, you have consistently uh, been able to do whatever that is. Okay, this might apply to Bible reading, you know. You might get up in the morning and, and have five minutes to read the Bible. We'll do it and do it every day, right? Don't, don't just do it w when the mood strikes you or or when you heard the preacher on TV and you got under conviction, or, or whatever, right? Okay, the second aspect of uh, fitness is what they call strength. Now, oddly enough, <clears throat> if they're gonna, if if you're being coached to get ready for a race, a marathon, or whatever. They don't just tell you to go out and run a lot of miles. Sometimes they'll tell you to lift weights or to ride a bicycle or to swim or do something else, what they call cross-training, because that will help build the strength of those muscles that you're going to be using. Well, the Bible is real clear about what strength is. You know, the joy of the Lord is our strength, right? But there's two specific things that build spiritual strength. There's prayer and there's praise. Let's talk about this. First of all, prayer. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Well, right? If Ephesians chapter 6, you're talking about spiritual warfare. Uh-huh. That's prayer. That's how we do this. It's a form of prayer. Ephesians 6 verse 10. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Be empowered through your union with Him. Draw your strength from Him, that strength which His boundless might provides. Put on the whole armor of God, the armor of a heavy-armed soldier, which God supplies, that you may be able to successfully to stand up against all the strategies and deceits of the devil. <clears throat> See, prayer is that union and communion we have with God. You know, if we try to go out and battle the devil, even we take the name of Jesus and we take scriptures on this and that, and we're not in that regular fellowship with the Lord, which is prayer, then our warfare against the devil is not going to be as successful as it should be. Verse 12, For we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents, but against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness. You know, we see the stuff going on in the world. Say, has this world gone crazy? Well, yes, they have, but it's because they're being influenced by spirit forces uh, in the heavenly sphere. 
Therefore, put on God's complete armor that you may be able to stand and resist your gra- and stand your ground on the evil day and having done all the crisis demands to stand firmly in your place. But the key to all of that is found in verse 18. It says, pray at all times, on every occasion, in every season, in the Spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty. And to that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in behalf of the saints. Well, he brought up another thing there, which I'll talk about in just a minute, that perseverance. But also, let's go to Isaiah chapter 28. <clears throat> there are several things in Isaiah talking about our strength. And in general... They all refer to us giving glory to God, which I'm putting that all under the heading of praise. Now, there's a lot of nuances in in our devotion to the Lord. You say, well, there's praise, there's worship, there's adoration, there's intimacy, there's exaltation. There's a lot of different ways in which that can be done. But let's read here Isaiah chapter 28, verse 5. It says, in that day, and he's talking about now, in that day, the Lord of hosts will become a crown of glory, (laughs) a corona, that's what the word crown is in Latin, a corona of glory and a diadem of beauty for the remnant of his people and a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and administers the law and strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. Well, I could give you examples in the scripture like in uh, 2 Chronicles 20 of where uh, God's people were confronted with enemies and and where Jehoshaphat sent the, 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 the choir out in front and they praised the Lord and then the enemy slaughtered themselves. And also, let's go to Isaiah chapter 61. Because praise is another one of those things that builds our strength. Especially when we don't feel like it. You know, that's, that's one of the things about running. Uh, you go out and, and the first, oh, mm, five minutes may be you're kind of okay. But, but after about eight minutes, when you, about the time you start sweating, it starts to not feel good anymore. And that's about when you want to stop. But you kind of got to, you got to press on through that. And then after you've been out there long enough, I mean, you can do it all day if you want to. Um, and it's this way with praise. Sometimes, uh, I'm, I'll speak for myself. Now, I'm not saying this is the way that it ought to be. But sometimes uh, when I am prompted that I need to, to, to just shut everything else out and just focus on God and praise Him and thank Him and give Him glory, I don't feel like it because of whatever is going on. And and that's when it really counts the most. I mean, if you're feeling all ooey-gooey inside toward God, well, great, praise Him then, but praise Him when you don't feel that way. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed and qualified, there's that make you fit thing, to preach the gospel, the good tidings to the meek, the poor, and the afflicted, He sent me to bind up and heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison and of the eyes to those who are bound. See, part of what puts people in bondage is is they don't see, they, they don't understand. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn to grant consolation and joy to those who mourn in Zion, to give them an ornament of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, 
the garment of praise instead of a heavy burdened and failing spirit that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. And in Isaiah 52, Verse 1 says, Awake! Awake! <clears throat> That's interesting because you know in Matthew 25, uh, the, the parable of the virgins, it says they all fell asleep. So uh, it, it's kind of, that's a pretty good description, I think, for where we as the church of Jesus Christ are at right now in this time, is, is we're, we're, we're not really. Uh, fully awake. We're not fully fired up. Fully, I mean, we're, we, we've been uh, battling with what we've been battling and things have gone on for a long time and this and that and so we've kind of settled into uh, some lethargy. Okay? And God is saying, awake, awake. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments. Well, we just read over there in Isaiah 61, verse 3, that that involves praise. O Jerusalem, for henceforth there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and unclean. Shake yourself from the dust. See, the dust, remember, is a metaphor for the old man, uh, the, the old unregenerate, unsaved humanity that we used to be. Sit erect in a dignified place, Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Okay, I mentioned uh, perseverance a moment ago. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Even runners that are not training for a marathon are still encouraged to do what we call a long run. The, 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 uh, the metaphor in, uh, in the running world is LSD, long, slow distance. Is there, is there an A in perseverance or an E? It's an A, okay. I always get that one mixed up. Perseverance. Okay. And what is a long run? Well, it's like at least twice as long as what you do every day. So if you're used to running two miles every day, then a long run would be four miles. Or if you're used to doing three, then a long would be six, or whatever, whatever it is. But it's like, go, go double what you normally do. Well, there are certain things where, where God tells us uh, to do that, and there's reasons for it. But first of all, here in Hebrews chapter 12, some of these might surprise you, actually. Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, every unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us, and let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us, looking away from all that would distract to Jesus, who is the leader and source of our faith and is also its finisher. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the and ignoring the shame, it is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Now this is talking about our commitment, right? It, it's talking about um, us doing it anyway. You know, just do it. And, and uh, he, he mentions up there in uh, verse 1, the business about... Um, well, there's things that, that are holding us back. We'll probably deal with th that aspect in, in another message. But I will say this. If you're, 
going to be running uh, for a long time, especially outside in Texas heat. You don't want to be overdressed, and you don't want to be carrying a whole bunch of stuff with you. Now, you know, I generally carry a, a, a bottle of Gatorade with me, but that's about it, you know. And even, even carrying a, a cell phone can be a problem sometimes. Well, what are we talking about here? What are you talking about, uh, you know, persisting and, and keeping on, keeping on? Well, you know, he mentioned there in, in verse 1 that what it is that we're trying to do is, is, is to not sin. Well, you know, most of us have, uh, have gotten over the, uh, you know, the big bad ones. But then, okay, go to Colossians chapter 3. There, there's some, some other sins besides, uh, you know, drunkenness and adultery and uh, robbing and, and murder and so forth. That um, There's some other things besides that. Um, let's see, Colossians chapter 3. Three verse. Um, well, let's start at verse five. It says, "So kill the evil desires lurking in your members, those animal impulses, and all that is earthly in you that is employed in sin: sexual vice, impurity, sensual appetites, unholy desires, and greed and covetousness. For that is idolatry." It's like okay. Yeah, we know that. It says it's because of those things that the, uh, the anger of God is ever coming upon the sons of disobedience. And among those you once walked <clears throat> when you were living in and addicted to such practices. But now, he's saying, okay, you got rid of all of that. Well, there's a deeper level of some stuff we need to get rid of here. But now put away and rid yourself of these things. Anger, rage, bad feeling toward others, curses and slander, foul mouth abuse and shameful utterances from your lips. And do not lie to one another, for you've stripped off the old self with its evil practices. See, this is something that, that, is, uh, that it requires perseverance. The, the, you know, this is something that, that we need to be in it for the long haul on that. You know, we, we should not be excusing ourselves for, for any of that stuff. We should be willing to do what it says there in Hebrew, which is to get rid of it. Anytime we see it, it's like, okay, throw that one out. But then go to Romans chapter 15. There's another aspect of uh, perseverance in our faith that, that God's looking for us to do. Romans 15, verse 5. It says, Now may the God who gives the power of patient endurance. See, he will give us this. It's not something you have to come up with on your own. You just make the choice to do it, and he'll enable you to do it. Who gives the power of patient endurance, who supplies encouragement, grant you to live in mutual harmony and full sympathy with one another in accord with Christ Jesus. <laughs> this is one the church has failed at for millennia. The, the church, by and large, has failed to... to to keep up any kind of um, being in harmony. He says that together you may unanimously with united hearts and one voice praise and glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You know, it, it's like Christians get, they get to an impasse or they get to an argument or a disagreement or something and they're ready to split and start a new denomination. Well, I mean, there is error and there is truth. But the point is, I don't think God intended for any of those splits to happen the way they happened. It was because people were not 
persevering with, with the, the command to do what we read over there in Colossians. They were not persevering in, in just trying to, to be loving. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians 13 that love never fails. Just saying. Revelation chapter 3. Again, here's some more encouragement that God will enable us to do this. Revelation 3, verse 10. But this tells you how to do it. Because you have guarded and kept my word of patient endurance. You have held fast the lesson of patience and of the, with the expectant endurance that I give you. I will keep you safe from the hour of trial and testing which is coming upon the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth. And Steve talked about this on Friday night. He talked about the, the wilderness experience and how amazing, how awesome that's going to be because the, the church, the ones that... that that go there, that flee there when they're supposed to, um, are fed and kept safe, and the rest of the world is, is uh, going through hell. And that God is actually going to send back those 144,000 man-child to, to shepherd and, and to, to lead and help those uh, Christians that are in that uh, protected place. But before that, even in verse 9, it says, Take note, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and learn and acknowledge that I have loved you. <clears throat> we'll see, verse 10 tells you why verse 9 is going to happen. It's because they have kept the word. And that doesn't mean, okay, I, I keep the Bible on the, on the coffee table in my living room. No, it means you have kept the word, and you've hid your wor the word in your heart that you wouldn't sin against God. That, that takes some perseverance. Finally, and I will say that among running coaches, there's a lot of disagreement about where in the order of things this last one goes. And to some extent, it may depend on what kind of race you're, you're in. And that is speed. You know, if you're just going to run a 100-yard a dash or even uh, a mile, they might put that uh, either here or there uh, because, you know, it, it's specific to what you're, you're doing. But even if you're, you're training for a long run, a long race, and folks, we have been in a long race. Have we not here at Romans 8? I mean, I've been with this church 42 years. And most of you have, have been with this church for decades. Okay, so you're, we're, we're in, the, the metaphor in the running world is we're in a marathon here, okay? So how does speed factor into that? Because, you know, you don't, you don't run a marathon as fast as you run a 100-yard dash, well, but still, in the training, there's what they call uh, intervals, or sometimes they call them striders, where you'll, uh, you'll run along just a normal, and then all of a sudden, you'll speed it up for, you know, 100 yards. Say, okay, that telephone pole down there, I'm going to run, I'm going to sprint to that telephone pole. And then you do it, and then you kind of, you kind of recover, and then you go a little ways longer, and you see another telephone pole down there. So you, you sprint again. Well, what are we talking about here? Well, interestingly enough, we go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. This has to do with the Word. Interestingly enough, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, in the King James, they use the word diligence. But the Greek word for diligence is spudo, or spude, which actually means speed. You have to be diligent. You, know, you have to get it done. Okay, and in, in 2 Timothy 2.15 it says, 
Study and be eager and do your utmost. That's that spude word. To present yourself to God approved. A workman who has no cause to be ashamed. Correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. Now, a lot of Christians don't want to do that. You know, they don't, they don't think, well, it's not my job to look up the words in Strong's Concordance and see what they mean and to, to see where all in the Bible this certain uh, situation happens. And I'll leave that to the preachers. I'm just a, you know, a run-of-the-mill Christian or whatever. Well, then you're not doing speed work. You've left your speed work out because... And I, okay, one say, well, but he wrote this to Timothy. Well, he wrote it to us. You know, the Bible is to us. And in 1 Timothy chapter 4, I'll leave you with this. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, he tells Timothy something else that's some really good advice for all of us. Verse 13. Till I come, you know, I think this is Jesus talking to us. Till I come, devote yourself to reading. Some people say, oh, I don't like to read. I just like to watch it on a screen. Well, read. There's something you'll get when you read it that you won't get just watching it on a screen. Devote yourself to reading, to exhortation, to teaching and instilling doctrine. Oh, well, that's all cut and dried stuff. I'm not interested in doctrine. Well, then you're not doing speed work. You know, you need to understand the doctrines of the Christian faith. You need to understand blood covenant. You need to understand substitutionary atonement. You need to understand predestination because sooner or later you're going to run across some Baptist or Presbyterian or somebody says, well, I was predestined to go to heaven. And, and you've got, you need to understand why they say that and why they're, they're, they're really not totally on solid ground with that. It's like, this is doctrine. Okay, if you say, oh, I don't care about doctrine, I just know I'm saved, and that's all I care about. Well, then you're not doing speed work. Doctrine, teaching, and do not neglect the gift which is in you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, right? Do not neglect to pray in the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times somebody has asked me a, a theological question or, or a real uh, personal dilemma that they were in. And I thought, oh, Lord, what do I say to this person? And so I just, in, in, within myself, I start praying in the Holy Spirit. And it's like the answer comes out. And it's like, wow, I didn't know that. Because it's the Holy Spirit. So do not neglect the gift which is in you which was directly imparted to you by prophetic utterance when the elders laid their hands on you. And practice and cultivate and meditate upon these duties. Throw yourself wholly into them. See, if you're going to run a marathon, you've got to throw yourself into it. It's not, oh, I just think I will. I'll go out and do it and see what happens. No, you've you got you to make a, a decision that you're going to do this Throw yourself into them so that your progress may be evident to everybody. And look well to yourself, to your own personality, and your own teaching. You know what? I can get up here and I can spout all kinds of stuff. I'm a good spouter, let me tell you. You know, I'm, I've, I, my mother always used to say that I, I could, I could uh, talk a blue streak. Well, I can. But you know what? It's, it, it's got to apply to me first. And that, that's the way ministry is. You know, if you're not preaching to yourself first, then there's no credibility there. Okay, look well to yourself, your own personality, to your own teaching. And if by doing so, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So, Father, I thank you for, for showing me how the things that, that I've learned through running have, have a spiritual application. And I thank you, Father, that you supply 
the, the, the strength. You supply the perseverance. You supply the diligence. And, and that you supply the, the spiritual uh, impetus that we need for all of these things. But we need to choose it. So I thank you, Father, for you giving everyone grace to choose the things that are pleasing to you. And to you be all.